I have the privilege of co-facilitating this conversation with Jess Young Chang, who you'll hear from shortly. She is a second year Master of Divinity student here at HCS and the incoming president of our student association. Along with Dr. Davis, we'll be in conversation with uh, Dr. Thomas and Jamie Johnson Riley and Kayla Smith. But first, it is my privilege to introduce our very special guest, Dr. Fania Davis. Dr. Davis is a longtime social justice advocate, activist, civil rights trial attorney, writer, restorative justice practitioner, and educator with a PhD in indigenous knowledge. Studying with African indigenous healers cat catalyzed her search for healing justice, leading her to serve as founding director of restorative justice of Oakland Youth and co-founding board member of the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice. That's just a hint of her accomplishments. But I want us to get right into conversation to be able to hear from her. Dr. Davis, thank you for being here. Thank you for writing this amazing book that has anchored us all year. And this conversation is so timely for so many reasons. So I want to turn things over to you and first just invite you to share, uh, to open in your own way and to begin with sharing reflections about where we are in this moment as a, as a nation. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Bartholomew. And if it's okay, can I call you Melissa? Yes. Please do. Okay. And thanks so much, Dean Holland. Um, and um, gratitude to all of the panelists and to everyone here today. Um, I'd like to begin just by acknowledging the ancestors of the land where I am. I am in Oakland in the San Francisco Bay Area, and this is the unceded territory of the Chochenyo Ohlone people. <clears throat> and I just wanna add that when we do these land acknowledgements, um, it is to acknowledge that this is a, geno a post-genocidal land, not that much different in that way from Rwanda and Germany. This is an occupied land, not that much different from the West Bank or from Ukraine. And so it's just important that we open our events with these acknowledgements of historical harm, that harm that continues today, that has unending afterlives. And um, also to say that we have yet as a nation to fully um, recognize, take responsibility for, and repair these harms. Um, just wanted to start with that. Thank you so much, um, Melissa, for the poem, for the beautiful breath work, for the acknowledgement of Black uh, oppressed Indigenous peoples, um, and of course, for the souls that have been lost, um, that are constantly uh, uh, being lost. Um, thank you so much for that. And thank you for the centerpiece. Uh, it brought me back to, I think it was 2019. Is that when we were there doing the workshop? Great. And I loved hearing too about the spaces that you're creating and thinking of the centerpiece in restorative justice, we use these centerpieces to, um, to affirm that um, there are no sides. Um, there's only one circle and one center. And that center is um, our desire for justice, our desire for healing. Um, and usually also in the centerpiece, there's some water, some fire, or air, or earth. And that represents our connection, not only with one another, but with the entire uh, creation, all of the multiple forces that, that pulsate throughout creation. We are one with one another and with all of these. So it was beautiful to see that, that, talk, that uh, centerpiece. Um, Melissa, if it's okay, I'm gonna read a very brief statement that I'm uh, writing uh, an op-ed about the, is that okay? Yes, have your okay. own way. Yeah. When deliberations in the Derek Chauvin trial began, the nation shuddered at the thought of the turbulence, turmoil, and terror an acquittal would, would unleash. We heaved a collective sigh of relief as the court announced the jury's verdict. The triple guilty verdict of a uh, four um, affords a measure of solace to George Floyd's family and to all who are drowning in grief over police terror. It's a win for the social movement that has shaken the world, having peaked during the summer of 2020, when the largest demonstrations occurred, the most diverse demonstrations occurred in human history. 
The verdict also offers an opportunity to breathe new life into the truth reparations and reimagining efforts already underway across the nation, including what you're doing there at Harvard. But the verdict is not justice, I say. If anything, it achingly demonstrates that justice as we know it is wanting. Our current way of thinking about and doing justice does not and cannot meet the moment. We need to imagine a new justice that does and can. Rooted in slavery, convict leasing, the chain gang, Jim Crow, and continuing into the present with mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, and crimigration, our justice system itself is a perpetrator of massive harm. We need new justice futures, no less than new public safety futures. Our way of justice clearly doesn't have the capacity to meet the moment. For one thing, it's designed to address only individual harm and too often ineffectively and inequitably at that. The nation's policing problem isn't just individual, it's systemic. So true justice requires more than successful prosecution of individual officers. It requires us to reckon with and disrupt the histories, legacies, and systems of racial terror and white supremacy that like monsters who we think are dead but keep coming back, relentlessly reproduce themselves. Plus, our justice system looks backwards to blame, judge, and punish people for past harm. In accusing, adjudicating, and sentencing, it responds to the original harm with another. Well, what about stopping future harm? What about repair? What about healing? Justice, as we know it, can't stop the killings. This was heartbreakingly plain to see with three police killings occurring every day during the three week Chauvin trial, like a deadly virus completely out of control. A 13-year-old with hands up killed in Chicago, a young man killed in Florida, a mentally ill man shot in New Hampshire, 20-year-old Dante Wright shot just miles from the George Floyd trial. And a 16-year-old girl shot six times by Columbus, Ohio police on the same day the verdict came in. We don't even expect US justice to stop the killings, but why not? Why do we require so little? Why not imagine a new, more capacious justice that sets its sights on stopping the killings and creating a new and just future. The Chauvin verdict signals it's time to re-envision justice. And true justice means a holistic justice that recognizes harm, takes responsibility for harm, uh, repairs harm, and prevents its recurrence. A process led by those most negatively impacted and pursued by respectful, democratic, and relational means. A justice that transforms both unjust relationships and systems, one that requires us to transform ourselves in ways we want to transform the world. Transformative justice and restorative justice inform truth processes rooted in indigenous wisdoms about humanity, collectivity, responsibility, and the earth are our best hope. So let's awaken to the moment. Let's actively support and nurture the truth reparations and reimagining initiatives bubbling up all over the country, whether in communities, schools, universities, churches, and whether at local, state, or national levels. Taken together, these are constituent elements of the holistic new justice that is dawning on the horizon. These are more complex, variegated, decentralized, community-driven, and holistic developments. And this is what the new justice will look like. This is not the moment to be satisfied by the limited justice on offer from the justice system, says Canadian restorative justice scholar and practitioner, Professor Jennifer Llewellyn. She adds, the fact that the justice system offered what it can and what it should in this moment should not obscure the vision or mute the calls for a better justice. The Chauvin verdict is a win, but it should not be mistaken for justice. 
So that, that concludes uh, the statement. Uh, Melissa, do you have any questions here or should we talk about that just a little bit before moving on? Yes, no, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis, for grounding us in this moment in such a powerful way. And I would invite you to share how you, you see and you envision restorative justice being a vehicle to, as you say, usher us into this, this new uh, uh, justice that's dawning on the horizons. I remember when we were in circle in the Brown Room when you co-facilitated that workshop for us a few years ago and you were finalizing your book um, and you shared with us some of your motivations. So I would love for you to offer uh, context for all those listening. What motivated you to write this book in particular mm -hmm. since and how, how do you see restorative justice as a way forward for this nation to help us usher this new dawn uh, on the horizon, this new justice yeah. on the horizon? Okay, I'll take uh, the first question first. Why did I write this book? Mm -hmm. um, I wrote it because when I discovered restorative justice uh, 2000, 2001 or so, it had been in existence then since about the mid 70s. So it was about 25, 30 years old. Um, I discovered it and of course my history, I'm, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I was born on Dynamite Hill. I have uh, experienced, directly experienced racial terror, uh, racial hate, you know, growing up in the South and, and I've lost two friends to um, uh, racial terror. Um, my husband and I were almost killed by police when they invaded our home because of our activism in support of the Black Panthers. My sister uh, was uh, targeted for legal lynching on capital charges. And so I have come out of all of those experiences in my childhood and early adulthood as a warrior for justice. I became a civil rights trial lawyer. And, um, and um, was kind of doing it out in the courtroom. And, and, and I was very, very angry too after um, what, two and a half, almost three decades of being this warrior for justice, of cultivating the hyper-rational, uh, uh, hyper-aggressive and uh, hyper-masculinist qualities that I was required to cultivate to be a successful street activist and trial lawyer. And I literally became sick and I knew intuitively that the universe was asking me, spirit was calling me to invite more healing energies and more creative energies and more spiritual energies into my life. And so I um, kind of uh, synchronistically ended up in a PhD program and studied with healers in Africa, got my PhD, came back here and essentially learned about restorative justice, which was quite a moment for me, an epiphany because I thought that, you know, with this justice that heals, this justice that um, does no harm to either party to a dispute, to paraphrase uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, this justice that is love, to paraphrase Dr. King, um, discovering this justice that was rooted in indigenous wisdoms of, of peacemaking and healing and, and acknowledging our interrelatedness amongst ourselves as humans and with all beings and, and all um, of the earth's energies. It was an epiphany for me because I, at that moment when I learned about restorative justice, felt that I could, I could integrate the lawyer in me, the warrior in me, uh, and the healer in me. Mm. Uh, and so then when I did a little research, I Googled race and restorative justice. Of course, that's, that was my, the first thing on my mind. Well, you know, what's happening um, there? What's happening at that intersection? And I unfortunately discovered nothing. Literally, I mean, literally there were, there were thousands of, 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 of books, well, not books, but a lot of literature, just a blossoming forth and a mushrooming forth of literature on restorative justice and books on restorative justice. I could find barely one or two of those thousands of publications on race. Um, so it, at that moment, I knew that I had to do something about it. You know. Um, this, the, our justice system, of course, is a justice system that disproportionately harms people of color. So how can a movement that purports to transform the restorative justice movement have no consciousness at all about race and racial justice? Um, so I knew my work was cut out for me and not only did I write this book, but, but um, 
we, we organized a few conferences that 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 uh, for the first for well, the first time there was a national dialogue on the intersections of racial justice and restorative justice was in 2013. I was very much involved in that. And then we organized subsequent conferences that invited more of these conversations and had more people of color uh, to the point that today, um, you know, we have a much a transformed restorative justice uh, movement. There are a lot of formerly incarcerated persons, persons of color, a lot of youth, um, um, and there are programs and books and articles and convenings on the subject of restorative justice and racial justice. Um, we still got a ways to go, but it sure looks different today than it did back in 2001 when I first learned about restorative justice. So that's essentially why I wrote the book. Thank you, thank you. And you, you know, as you know, we are, we've centered your texts in our work all year. And part of the work of transformation in our society involves every corner of society, including institutions like Harvard and like HDS. So my next question is gonna ask you to reflect on our HDS context. You indicated in your text, um, quote, healing interpersonal harm requires a commitment to transforming the context in which the injury occurs, the social historical conditions and institutions that are structured precisely to per perpetrate harm. And this commitment, this commitment you assert may mean viewing restorative justice as not only healing individual harm, but also transforming social structures and institutions that are themselves purveyors of massive harms. Not adopting a more expansive view runs the risk that restorative justice offers a quick fix addressing symptoms, but not underlying causes. So can you share your thoughts on how this framing might be helpful for institutions like ours as we work to build an institution that's anti-racist and anti-oppressive um, and note any potential challenges that we should be attuned to, particularly for a culture that is all about quick fixes? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, first of all, thanks so much for selecting uh, that book. And, and I think, was it Jamie who made that suggestion? And, uh, who will be speaking later. Yes, it was. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. Um, and thank you all for taking your time and energy to read and grapple uh, with this book. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess, I guess, um, you know, when I saw restorative justice practitioners, wonderful people, compassionate people, loving people, big hearted people, um, practice, do these, you know, uh, facilitate circles with no consciousness of racial justice or social justice. It was, it was just kind of shocking to me. And I, it, you know, that is the air that we breathe, that racial harm, that uh, uh, harm on so many levels. I mean, this is a nation uh, with an origin story that is centered in harm. We are a nation that was born in the blood and the oceans of blood, the blood of, of, um, of genocide, of terrorism, of land death, of, of, of racial terrorism, of uh, slavery, of the slave trade, of colonialism, of heteropatriarchy. That is our origin story. And you know origin stories say a lot about who we are. You know? It doesn't mean we have to be what you know, what we see in that origin story, but uh, certainly that would take a lot of effort and work and, and intention, um, intentionality. So, um, you know, the whole idea that our culture is a towering monument to harm, the whole idea that harm, whether it's um, white supremacy, uh, whether it's racial terrorism, um, uh, permeate and pervade and even saturate all of our institutions and our collective consciousness, leaving nothing untouched. The harm is just incalculable, it's unfathomable. Um, harm to our bodies, to our minds, our spirits, our families, our communities on our earth, our waters, our air. And so I am very attracted to restorative justice because it helps us to, 
to begin to interrupt that harm. I mean, as I, as I said earlier, Mahatma Gandhi says justice is that act that does no harm to either party to a dispute. Um, how can we stop doing harm? How can we interrupt this harm that just keeps going, um, keeps going? Um, and you know, part of it is that, of course, we have we have um, not faced that harm. We have not looked at it. We have not looked in the mirror. But the beauty of today is this is the time of awakening. People are understanding that we're not born in liberty and the, and the proposition that all are created equally. Oh, we are born in terror and we are born in blood. And so for the first time, we are beginning to face um, you know, this, this, this history, uh, this horrific, this hideous, this unspeakable history. And that gives me hope as, um, as um, uh, you know, it has been said, uh, Maya Angelou has said, um, history and all its wrenching pain cannot be unlived. But if we face it with courage need not be lived again. And I think we're at a moment now, um, at an inflection point now where we are beginning to face that history and so that we need not live it again. But it takes more than facing the history, of course. It takes taking responsibility for it, taking action to repair the harm, and taking action to ensure there is no recurrence. And those, in, those are the four R's of restorative justice accountability as I see it. I love that because it, you're highlighting that as an institution, we cannot avoid facing our origin story as an institution, and as, a, as a society, as a country. Part of institutional change involves grappling with the historical harms that are embedded within our institutions as a result of being uh, embedded within society. So this work that we've been doing with the help of your beautiful book um, has allowed us to explore part, parts of our history, uh, our story, our origin story as a nation. Um, and that has to remain a critical part of our restoration going forward. So I appreciate that. And I love what you said earlier about, you know, the spaces that you're creating, you're creating trust processes, you're creating spaces where you're doing circles, where you're deeply connecting with one another, where you're engaging on heart to heart levels, you're engaging with compassion and empathy um, uh, and authenticity and bravery, you know, mm -hmm. to look in the mirror and you know that we we need I mean, to to talk about healing in some ways is really subversive, mm -hmm. because ours is a culture of harm. You know? Yes, yes. And you know, but it doesn't mean that we just have our crystals and feathers and we do our healing and we're in this you know kind of uh, 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 ethereal space. No, it means being very grounded um, in the harm um, um, and aware of it. You know. Uh, aware of uh, and, and intensely aware of, of doing all that we can to begin to interrupt uh, these endless cycles of harm. Yeah. So creating these, these are like liberated spaces. They're like maroon communities. You know, when our ancestors uh, escaped from slavery, they created these sheltered and protected remote communities, you know, where they lived in freedom or as much free and as much freedom as they could at that time. And they had their economies, they had their educational systems, they had their health. We need to create spaces uh, uh, like that. And, 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 and especially spaces where we connect with one another in deep and heartfelt and healing ways. We, we need those um, as an important part of, of our journey toward healing and justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for naming that and highlighting that. And that has been our intention and will continue to be. And this is a great point to bring in Dr. Todney Thomas to join us in our conversation. So I invite Dr. Thomas to turn off the camera if it was on, if it's on, I can't see you. Um, Dr. Thomas, I thank you. There you are. So, so much for agreeing to be a part of our conversation. And um, before I ask you your question. I just wanted to say a brief word. Dr. Thomas is a 
social cultural anthropologist and associate professor of African American religions at HDS and her newest book, Kincraft, The Making of Black Evangelical Societal, was just released through, a uh, sociality rather, was just released through Duke University Press. Mm. So, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for being here and being a part of this conversation. It's a perfect point to bring you in. From your perspective as a professor at HDS, can you provide thoughts on restorative justice and, and what uh, Dr. Davis has so beautifully shared in terms of the points of uh, of, of, uh, uh, of restorative justice that are important for us in this work. How restorative justice can support our work as a community in realizing our vision and any particular themes or insights from Dr. Davis's text that excite you um, that you believe might be helpful and then share any concerns you might have about restorative justice. So first I'd just like to, to honor the invitation uh, to just express my gratitude, how humbled I am to be here, how grateful I am to be here, to be in community in a time such as this. Um, I'm just grateful for um, all the labor that's gone forth um, uh, in terms of this text, in terms of the spaces you've been convening. Um, and I'm just um, really honored to be here and grateful um, and a little hungry actually. So I'm, I'm glad to kind of be getting, getting filled in a way. Um, mm -hmm. I'd also just like to extend my congratulations and my thanks to Melissa, who's really, re, you know, recently completed her PhD. Um, Kayla, um, who uh, did a presentation on her thesis this morning. Uh, Jamie, who suggested this text. Um, and Dr. Davis um, for this amazing um, work. Um, I met Dr. Davis last year as a Radcliffe Fellow. And I was just, even the introduction about your story, I will reiterate what I've said, that I am so hungry for your memoir. Um, the, the call to balance, right? Um, I think really naming battle fatigue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the need for balance. What it, that restorative justice is, is not just about writing the skills of balance. It is also a sustainable justice for those of us who believe in freedom and cannot rest, right? That our inability to rest doesn't need to mean premature death, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I am, I am so grateful for the, the spiritual call, the, the autoethnographic quality and offering and frankness of your story. And I just, I'm hungry for so much more. Um, in terms of uh, just thinking about restorative justice, uh, race and restorative justice in the divinity school, um, I was so um, impressed by the outline of the text. Um, and I was struck by, um, the, the move from different contexts, from education to the, the, the carceral, carceral context, um, to thinking about um, spaces in which um, modes of, of restorative justice have been enacted, right? We get scenes of practice. And I thought about, you know, perhaps the naysayer or, or the person that might say, well, maybe restorative justice is more about um, the carceral, right? You know, because we talk about educational examples when we talk about the over-policing of schools. Um, but I, I was prompted or just, it, it came upon my spirit this morning to think about why we really need restorative justice in educational institutions and in educational institutions like ours, right? We might be tempted, oh, that's not our issue, we're different, we're, that's a different kind of school, we're talking about public education. Um, there's, there's Tree Africa or De, De, Delisha Africa, right? So for those of you who don't know, this week, uh, news broke that the remains of a child who was murdered during the state bombing of the MOVE community in Philadelphia in 1985, the remains of an African-American child um, were used in a forensic anthropology course at Princeton University, right? And that those remains had been held somewhere between University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University. Right? So we're talking about Ivy League education. We're talking about uh, the, the aura of state-sanctioned state terror, right? And imagine hearing this news as a black woman and anthropologist, right? Teaching a field methods class after hearing about the murder of Makia Bryant, right? So Tree Africa uh, would have passed at 14 years old. 
Galicia Africa would have been 12 years old, right? Makia Bryant was 16 years old. And imagine hearing about that as a scholar of Black church arson where the names of Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robinson, and Carol Denise McNair haunt me regularly, right? It's tempting. And I think this is part of a thing that I've been, I've been reading about James Baldwin, how Baldwin talks about uh, the 16th Street, 16th Street Baptist Church is a temptation for moral distancing, right? That's that case. That's those people over there. That's that type of institution. Um, the ways in which we um, want to let ourselves off the hook, where the acknowledgement of harm um, frightens us so much that, that we, we want to create distance. Um, and for those of us who are on the underside of power, um, rather than that distance, we experience an onslaught. Um, our institution, the type of institution we inhabit is not exonerated um, from the kinds of harm um, that is precipitated in the tides of white supremacy, anti-Blackness, uh, carcerality, right? Um, how can we be surprised if some of our most prestigious institutions treat the remains of Black bodies in such a way, right? Um, how can we exonerate ourselves and express horror about what the police are doing when this is our approach to Black bodies, Black life matter? And so, um, and, and, and this also is accompanied by some very frank conversations that came up in my field methods class this week about the coloniality of higher education, uh, the kinds of tolls, the kinds of costs, that minoritized people pay for their educational attainments, right? The stories we all tell at the water cooler, right? um, uh, about the racism of low expectations and the suspicion of high educational attainment, right? That our institutions, institutions like HDS, right? Uh, consistently commit harm, right? Because of the coloniality um, of higher education. I also want us to sit and pause and think about um, something that's often challenging for students who are in race classes with me, and that is that harm is not about intent, right? That we inhabit institutions. It might feel a particular, particularly onerous that we have an institution that we didn't necessarily build, but that we inherit modes of privilege and oppression that we inherit, but that inflict harm regularly, that are beyond our intent or our heart or our intentions or our vision or who we are on the inside or who we aspire to be or the work we want to do to heal our world, that this harm continues every day, right? And so the need for intervention, specific intervention, right? Not, not individual, <laughs> right? If anything, we're seeing all these cases pile up, right? I mean, this has been a hard Black week, right? This has been a hard week. Not that it's ever easy, but this has been a hard, I mean, I feel like I wake up in the morning and I've been like, I almost don't want to open my eyes, right? Because what am I going to see when I check the news? Um, that that the, the, the piling up, that the institutional, individual responses won't be enough. Um, and so those are the things that come to mind. What kinds of curriculum do we need to support? Do we need to allot funding for? Do we need to invest in? Um, what kinds of conversations do we need to have? Who needs to be responsible for addressing that harm? So one of the things that I found so inspiring was learning about the structure of restorative justice circles and thinking about the structure of this panel, right? That we have faculty and staff and students, right? And that the, the, the point was not to create a hierarchical conversation, but to gather and collect the collective wisdom. I mean, if it weren't for Jamie, we wouldn't be here. Uh, the collective genius <laughs> uh, that, that we all hold, um, that that needs to be a part of how we think about addressing harm, that the, 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 the way forward are these kinds of conversations, right? Trusting in that collective experience and wisdom. So I'm thinking about uh, resisting exoneration and moral distancing, right? When Baldwin's in San Francisco and people in San Francisco says there's no space between Birmingham and San Francisco, right? Uh, resisting that moral distancing, thinking about 
um, the coloniality of education and, and how that's uh, examined at the level of institutions and lived experience and making sure that as we address this harm, as we try to change the culture or as Dr. Davis says, narrative change, right? Um, that we have everyone in the room, that we trust in the collective genius, that we move away from some of the hierarchical tendencies of our culture um, to really gift ourselves and benefit from the collective genius that all the members of our community hold. Amen. That's a, the perfect place to pause. Um, I, I just appreciate you so and wish we had more time, but I was struck right away when you shared restored justice as a sustainable justice for those who, those of us who believe in freedom and cannot rest. I mean, that just nourishes me so and highlighting all that you've highlighted in terms of our uh, institutional commitments and the fact that it addresses harm beyond intent um, and uh, how valuable it is to make sure that we are moving in a way that's decolonized. And, and you know, as you know, this panel was intentionally crafted in the way that you just described with staff and faculty and students to be with our, our outside scholar practitioner. Um, so uh, we will continue in this way with you, Dr. Thomas, and thank you for highlighting what you have shared. And I wanna bring on now, Jamie, the woman of the hour, um, Jamie, if you would turn on your camera for us, please. <laughs> Jamie has been with this community for the, the longest out of all of us on this panel. Um, she has been an assistant, she's an assistant registrar at HDS and with over 25 years of experience in higher education, a native Bostonian, uh, and she uh, prioritizes family and community. They are at the heart of what invigorates and sustains her. She's a member of the Racial Justice and Healing Committee. And um, as we have said, she is the one who offered the suggestion for this book at the beginning of the summer when we first began talking about reorientation and common read, all of the members submitted ideas for books. And even though I had read and used Dr. Davis' book in my own class, I, it wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about it as a common read text. And, and Jamie offered the book and I was like, oh my gosh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, so, but for this text, um, uh, we wouldn't be as, as where we are in terms of this conversation about restorative justice and, and, and looking at it as a way forward. So Jamie, I just wanna honor you and thank you for your presence and all that, that you have brought to this community. So as you have been with us throughout the year and engaged in this text, do you have thoughts about how uh, restorative justice can be utilized as a way forward um, for HDS? And any points from Dr. Davis's text that you wanna highlight um, that have stuck out for you? Yes. So first of all, I just wanna say thank you to you, Melissa, for being the heart and the soul of this, you know, and for all of your work so let me take a moment to honor you in all that you do. And, you know, I'm so honored and humbled to be part of this panel with, you know, Dr. Davis, Dr. Thomas, Jessica, you know, Kayla, you know, what a privilege, you know, this is for me. Um, one of the things I want to sort of highlight that sort of resonated with me from the book. And I'm gonna read my notes here because I was like, okay, I gotta write this stuff down. Um, Dr. Davis says, if we are to move into a future, we need to do no less than reimagine what it means to be human in relationship to one another and to the earth and her inhabitants. And I wanna frame my next comments with uh, a piece that I read and I'm gonna apologize now because I'm probably gonna, I may butcher the name. It's from a book of poetry by Gila Lapidit. And the book is called One Way with Heaven, One with Heaven, sorry. And it's on acceptance. And I think it sort of speaks to where we are now and everything that's going on. And it reads, my heart is weeping and I want to let it cry. My chest is aching and I want to let it suffer. My spirit is low, and I want to carry the sorrow. Tolerance is required in times of pain. Forgiveness and compassion will follow. No regrets, just understanding, just 
acceptance. So I want to, you know, sit with that for a moment because one of the thing, the other things that I thought about is that we are in a time where there's such a sense of disillusionment, right? Because there's been a lot of trauma, you know, due to the continued inhumane treatment of people of color. So, you know, I thought about this. I said, so where do we begin, right? So it begins with all of us, right? It begins with these types of programs which start to look at and communicate the harm that's being done. And it allows for us to be in conversation and community with one another and to discuss the ways to begin the work, right? Because this is the beginning, right? This type of work takes care, it takes time. And I sort of see HDS as serving as a role model um, on ways to engage the entire community and to begin to really look at, um, you know, making the entire community an integral part of regaining our humanity, right? And, um, and sort of meeting folks where they are, right? And ensuring that each member of the community feels heard and appreciated for their contributions to the whole. You know, and I think that the way that you designed this space speaks to that. And, you know, I wanna also sort of go back to another point that Dr. Holland made from the book that I also picked up on. And that's what Dr. Davis says, we can hold a new future and we can create a nation that is no longer racially fractured, right? That work needs to be done. So in closing, I just look forward to being a part of that work and helping to see those fractures start to be mended, right? So that eventually we can, we can see them scar over and begin the, you know, begin taking that restorative path in healing. Beautiful, beautiful, Jamie. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you are a part of the work. You have been and uh, will continue to be a part of the work. I love your expression of uh, the, some of the essential components of restorative justice that it takes time, it takes care, and it's helping us to um, center the work of regaining our humanity within our institution. And that's work that you can't rush. It's work that has to work with, you know, be worked with intention. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Jamie. Um, for the ways in which you have been contributing to the rebuilding of our humanity. Um, and it's, it's a great time now to transition to our beautiful students. I wanna turn things over to Jess Young, who is going to be in conversation with Kayla Smith. Thank you so much, Dean Bartholomew. Uh, I am Jess, it is my supreme pleasure and delight to introduce or reintroduce to all of us, Kayla J. Smith. Kayla J. Smith, she, her, is a third year MDiv candidate who focuses on black religious and cultural studies, womanism and restorative and transformative justice. She is the president, my president of Harambi, students of African descent and a member of the racial justice and healing committee and a standing committee, committee on diversity and inclusion. Kayla, from your perspective as a student at HDS, can you provide your thoughts on how restorative justice can support our community in realizing our vision as an anti-racist anti and anti-oppressive school? Uh, I'd love to hear about any particular theme or insight from Dr. Davis's work that excites you and that you feel will be helpful, or also any concerns that you have about restorative justice. Thank you, Jess. And also just want to echo all the gratitude we've all been sharing that this is a very historical moment that we're in and to have all these beautiful black faces leading this program today is such a joy and I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, so restorative justice in ways that we can use it at uh, HDS. So first is starting off just with our history as a school. So um, Harvard, as we know, is the first college in the United States. And so sitting with that, and then also too, it was a college uh, that was for training ministers. So Divinity School has a very particular relationship with building the practices, beliefs, and values and all the system of white supremacy, not only in the US, but across the country. Like 
that is on our shoulders to deal with and they were also a part of that history. So that is one thing of acknowledgement and dealing with that. And then also going to two, if like we've been talking about the structures of even how with every decision making, all of the feedback, what's happening, you have to have students a part of it. Um, there would be no school, there's people not here to want to learn things. So it's very critical to have folks who are showing up to the space to have what they need. And if we are to take serious uh, restorative justice, it has to be a part of every ounce in every crevice of our institution. And so to me, that looks like um, classroom culture. So I think every classroom, there is a space to have people just checking in. Like, I don't know how large, how small, but even just one or two words, but like that is something that's so personal and invites people to show up in the space because when we're here, we're not just coming into a space and like, we, we have lives, what I'm trying to say. All of us have lives outside of the classroom, outside of work, outside of teaching. And so being able to, as Dr. Uh, as Dean Mitholomew was saying earlier, embrace our humanity, checking in is a great part of that. And then also to, uh, if we're gonna embed this into our, into our uh, culture, it has to be taken seriously with the classroom, the type of, excuse me, the courses that we offer. So we're gonna talk about healing. We have to have that as something that's permanently uh, a part of the syllabi and courses that are offered. These type of restorative justice and racial, ju racial justice uh, initiatives being offered not just one or two times after the semester and also being able to be a part of um, required courses and having the scholars here right to do these things people who know how to do this training folks who are most affected when it comes to racial justice and healing those people have to be here and again both permanently and tenure I think that's a way to show up in the sense of real restorative justice and being present um and some themes that came up for me uh in chapter four about race restorative justice and schools Dr. Davis talks about uh, on page 44, education as a liberatory practice. And I, with that, I thought about uh, Dr. Cornell West. He will always talk to students about truth, the capital T and thinking about paideia and just how education at any level, K through 12, all the way up, like we're saying to the Ivy Leagues, wherever, education is supposed to be, it is liberatory. So what do we do with this hard truth and knowledge and how it should be, it should be pers personally trans transformative and so with that, um, what do we do with that? And another thing uh, that came out of for me for chapter seven with A Way Forward uh, on page 96, Dr. Davis says, talks about moving beyond binaries. And that's to me the work of, um, I think the way we understand ourselves is just so much it has to be A or B. And we have to um, decode and unlearn ways of like it can be both and even when we're moving toward things of good that we can still and are still causing harm to each other and both in this world and um yes and now i want to talk about concerns um some some honest concerns i have is uh, having the white folks in our community show up how we need them to so it's so much about you have to decenter yourself, uh, especially white people, all of us, but white people especially have to decenter the power that they are used to having, the standard, all those things have to be taken back. And um, I worry with folks, again, it has to be a collaborative effort. effort. And so you really have to show up and give as much as you can. And, um, and that's something we've been dealing with for centuries now. So re really giving up stuff, I think is, we have a long way to go with that. And one more thing, and before I have we open up for our exchange. Um, so I don't want this, our initiatives toward restorative justice and towards racial just racial justice, excuse me, uh, restorative and racial justice to be something that's siloed and kind of off to the side. And as a community, we cannot have this being something that's identified as Dean Bartholomew's work, something that's something that's just with, and I want to say too, one person, one person cannot lead and fix an institution with over a 200 plus year history of white supremacy. So we have to do more of just like, it has to be a whole team of people helping leading this and that has to be something that's present. And, um, and with too, we'll be having folks as the change makers doing this work, um, thinking about just next year as you being the president and, and our student body government for the first time in history will be uh, students all, no, there will be no white student. These are all students of color. And with that history, 
these are the folks who have so much of their lives like personally affected by the scholarship and our initiatives here. And how is the university gonna take care of those who are trying to lead these efforts while also being the most uh, marginalized by doing the work? And I'll stop there. Kayla, thank you so much. You have lifted up so much wisdom and put down so much truth on hearts and minds this afternoon. I wanna lift up several things that you said, but one right now, and maybe one I can hold for later um, that I feel ties directly to some of the work of Dr. Davis in this text. On page 80, Dr. Davis writes, the principle of subsidiarity holds that those directly impacted by an offense should have decision-making powers about their lives. That statement feels like it feels very specifically applicable to HDS uh, as students have, have their lives directly and profoundly impacted by decisions of the staff, faculty, and administration, and ways in which HDS can dismantle white supremacist power structures, like you named, that remove students from processes about making decisions that directly impact us, impact our classrooms, impact our curriculum, impact our capacity to continue to afford to attend school here and graduate from here. Um, that feels like it is one of the principles that I heard you speak about that I also recognize in this work that I'm so grateful for you naming. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you both for this powerful sharing exchange and we want this to continue we want to open this up now for all of us uh all of the panelists dr davis jamie dr thomas to now just engage with each other and if there's anything percolating for any of you uh that you want to respond to that someone shared or a question that you have uh the floor is yours for a few moments before we transition to our next conversation point well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> There's just so much in this gumbo pot that we are co-creating here uh, this afternoon. Um, and it's all good stuff. Um, I mean, it's hard stuff, no question about that. Um, I want to say, you know, one thing, I want to start with this, self-care. Um, you know, the trauma um, is, is just, you know, it's thick. It's the air we breathe. It's the water we drink. It's what our ancestors, you know, since the beginning of time in this country have taken and ingested. Um, and, you know, I talked earlier about our culture being a towering, a colossal monument of harm. Um, I think it's important for us to always think about that and make decisions uh, based on the idea that we will interrogate, you know, these systems, that we will challenge, you know, uh, this way of living. We will challenge this way of relating to ourselves, our bodies, our spirits, our, our families. And it takes a, a very uh, nuanced awareness practice simply because we are, this is, as I said, you know, this is what we're born into. This is the water that we swim through. So being aware of how you are causing harm to yourself and not taking care of yourself, and I'm the first one that needs to take that advice. Um, but all of this is just to emphasize that um, history is calling us to become more skilled at being healers on every level, you know. Whether that means my making sure that I'm meditating, you know, every day, I'm putting good whole foods into my body, I'm, I'm inviting um, um, positive energies, uplifting energies into my life, and um, doing my walks in the in, in the in the park in the wilderness. Um, you know, if we are going to be in this for the long haul, it, we've just got to, you know, I was hearing you, uh, Todney, when you were talking about this being such a hard week, and then you said, but it's, it's always hard, essentially, for, for Black, it always has been that way. So it's, for me, that means that we must be very rigorous and thoroughgoing and compassionate with ourselves and, 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 and um, doing everything that we can to uh, reverse, you know, these vicious, uh, monstrous, hideous cycles of harm that are around us. Mm. Really appreciate you naming self-care, Dr. Davis, as an integral part of this work. Uh, we have all used the word healing, I feel like, this afternoon together, and, and it feels like a really important word to 
to, to dwell with and to spend some time sort of running our hands over our eyes, over our hearts over. Uh, and specifically, I want to lift up a point that Kayla made, uh, this idea of, of not being defined by binaries, right? Uh, the difference between healing and fixing, right? Bodies are not fixed, we are healed. Uh, what does it mean? What, what do we mean when we use the word healing? And how do we use that word in such a way that doesn't place us in a binary, that doesn't demand of others that their healing look or be or act like binary? And this is a question for all of us. I'd like to add, um, just there's just something about narrative change that just jumped out at me. And I think about um, binaries as these things that, that require you to sort of segment parts of your being. I think about um, African and African derived ontologies like binaries, boundaries are not really our jam, right? Individualism, the compartmentalized individual, I think about Fred Moten, consent not to be a single being, like that is, that is not <laughs> really, I mean, those are certain kinds of Western Enlightenment epistemologies. Um, I also think about um, you know, so for instance, to me, one of the, the vibrant things about this, this book, about the, the healer and the warrior, the Bodhisattva, is that, that, they, that it's about the confluence. It's not a choice. It's inhabiting both. It's about balance. You know, and I think about the ways in which the academy, um, you know, uh, sort of might require or, or request certain kinds of binaries. You're a scholar or you're a teacher, right? And one is supposedly more important than the other, right? I think about all the other roles, as Kayla mentioned, I, I'm not just a student, I'm a human. I think about being a mother, a single mother and being an academic, right? Like I, I wanna put all, I don't like my, my life having all these separate rooms. Certainly there are places I need to, I need sanctuary and I need space to just be me <laughs> in all my fullness, right? Um, but I think about our first planning meeting where my son, normally couldn't be bothered, right, about a Zoom meeting. I think he was very interested in, because he knows uh, Dr. Bartholomew. I think he's seen um, Kayla before from class. I think he was curious about Dr. Davis. Um, and so he was, you know, because after he's like, who is that? Who's that lady mama? Um, but that it didn't have to be, so you have to go to the other room because I'm in this meeting, right? And so I think about how binaries sort of, you know, requires to cut off the fullness of who we are. Um, and I also think about just this idea of the individual, even as we talk about self-care, care is also collected, right? The fact that Dr. Davis began the Q&A by saying, remember your care, that call to care, it's collective, right? Sharing an honest story about burnout, right? Like, what does it mean to have warrior fatigue? That's still collective, right? And so um, I think also some of these binaries, this choice that we have to be either this or that, the either or that Kayla was talking about, or that we have to promote one aspect of ourselves, the warrior at the expense of the healer, right? That I think that we're being called to, to hold, to be in confluence, to hold, right? Um, all the complexity and to know that we have the space to hold all those things, right? Sometimes I have to remind myself, you have more space inside you than you know, right? Um, and so, you know, it is like, admitting in your class that your son is burning a grilled cheese sandwich, right? And like being, I mean, I think the pandemic has in some ways forced us to let go of some of these facades and masks that we wear, right? I don't know if you have any experience of that, but you know, I'm trying to be the professor in my neoliberalism class and I smell smoke. <laughs> I, have to, I have to, you know, do I, do I break roll or do I, you know, go figure out there's a fire in my house, you know? And so the, the, the and, and the students were fine, right? The students were fine. The kid was fine, everything was fine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I love like Kayla's reflections. I love the call, the collective call to care that Dr. Davis said, and just these binaries don't, don't serve us that hopefully the thing we're moving forward, the thing that we're storing is not just harm, but a fuller humanity where we get to bring the fullness of ourselves and not have to make these painful choices about which part of me I share, right? Or which part of me I have to closet. I love that. I love oh, that. Dr. Davis, did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I do. Um, I think this is really important, this point about that Kayla makes and that, that uh, others of you and Tadney makes about um, letting go of the binaries, the 
either or, good, bad, right, wrong, guilty, innocent. Uh, those are ways of being and of uh, experiencing reality that chop and slice and dice our world and our reality. Those are ways that deny the inherent um, interrelatedness um, um, of all that is. And, you know, that sort of um, seeking that everything is, is connected, that everything is circular and, and um, that dispensing with binary ways of being is a very indigenous, uh, comes out of an indigenous sensibility. Uh, I mean, you can, you can see Africans both uh, practicing Christianity and their traditional religion, or, you, you know, 80% of Africans practice their traditional religion and go to, uh, they also will go to Western doctors. They don't see that as being in conflict in the ways that, and you're so right, Todd, neither warrior healer, you know, most people would say these are binaries, these are opposites. How can you be both at the same time? Uh, so I think part of this uh, reimagining what it means to be uh, human that Jamie uh, referenced from my book is adopting these more holistic and collaborative and connective and, um, and, and uh, relational ways of embracing all of reality. I mean, we, in restorative justice, I don't like it when people use the word words victim and offender, because it, there again is that binary. And I know that a child in a classroom who might be cursing out a teacher um, um, may be suffering. They also be, may be a person who's being harmed. Maybe that child uh, has just lost a cousin or a brother or a sister to police violence or to mass incarceration. Uh, so we don't, that's, that child uh, is expressing trauma uh, and is not a, a, an offender who needs to be punished. And if you look closely enough, most people who harm are harming because they have caused harm. So there's no bright line separating that. And, and what I love about restorative justice, it, it's really, I think, the indigenous ways uh, that are at the heart of restorative justice for me. Uh, that are the ways to reassemble and remember uh, our fractured, uh, our broken reality, our separation and our division. Uh, yeah. This is such a beautiful point to transition uh, to our close as unfortunately we are close to, to ending our time together. We wanted to really end on healing and highlight Black healing in particular as we're in this period of ongoing um, highlighting of Black trauma and pain, and your book centers Black healing. And so we want to just end the conversation with thoughts of you know, Black healing and the power of Black healing and the universality of Black healing and how the healing of Black people is connected to the healing of all people. Um, so we just invite you know, Dr. Davis, do you have any reflections, any other, other, other panelists to just speak to to what comes to mind when you think about Black healing, Black joy, Black love? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Because oftentimes these conversations are just centered on the trauma of the Black bodies and the cultural states and all the ways in which we have been enslaved. Um, and yet we, we don't get to talk about and linger on the ways in which we have thrived and survived and how we have done it and what our joy and power and love look like. And, and we've been doing that actually all throughout this conversation. It's on display, but I'd love for anyone to give voice as the spirit moves. If there's anything you wanna share. I'm not quite sure how to say what I'm thinking. And so I'll try to be brief because I, I will screw it up less if I don't talk much. Um, I think that I am attentive to um, black embodiment that is on the margins or that feels on the margins of, of my own understanding of myself. And so like, what, what can I learn from black queer and trans bodies about black joy and black power and black health uh, and fullness? What can I learn from black disabled bodies about black healing 
and joy and fullness. Um, like that is, you know, I pay a lot of attention, I think, to folks who are living full and living bright uh, in a way that I'm unaccustomed to, uh, that enables me to bear witness to the beauty that I see and the beauty that I live and how we can share that. I can jump in if no one else. Thank you. Um, and I also want to say like, this is where spirituality and religion comes in so much. I think it's no coincidence that so many black people across the globe are deeply connected to some spirituality or form of religion because there's so much there around holistic transformation and we're talking about healing we have to focus on the heart the mind the spirit and most definitely the body and so so much with that I think um, black healing looks like restoration and equity amongst people's in all people lives and people having freedom over that complete agency and I think we say we're talking about black healing as universal healing because the core of white supremacy is anti-blackness across the world period so you have to focus on all the ways of like how black people are continuously being used to further uh further promote in, in the ways white supremacy is used and I think humility is required to achieve uh, restorative justice and healing and our human tendencies of defensiveness and self-protection uh, sometimes getting the way. And again, as Dr. Davis was saying, there's so much harm that's been happening to us that we repeat it to ourselves. So restorative justice is definitely a, a way to do this. And multiple approaches are needed too. I just wanna say multiple approaches are needed to get to black liberation and black healing. And it has to be from a collective stance. That's beautiful, Kayla. And um, I'll invite one more reflection from one of our panelists and, and also invite the audience now, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. I will try to get to a question or two. But any final reflections on Black healing from our panelists? I'll just say a few words. Um, yeah, so healing etymologically is related to wholeness and holiness. And Black people have been, you know, expressing their wholeness and their holiness um, just, you know, since the beginning of time. We talked about African uh, ways of, of, of apprehending and experiencing the world as holistic ways as opposed to fractured ways. Our music uh, um, is so holy, you know, our um, oratory is so holy, uh, our dance, our we are holy and, and, and embrace that wholeness too that is, is related to, to healing. So in many ways, it is already with us, you know, this, this, this way of being present in the world where we drop boundaries, we are not encased in our, we are communitarian beings, we are interrelational being, uh, beings and black people have carried this. Um, and so it's really, um, you know, coming back to who we are in many ways and, you know, coming back to our ancestral origins and embracing the healing, the wholeness and the holiness. That's beautiful. I love uh, what you just expressed by people have expressing our holiness and our wholeness, our holiness and our wholeness. Mm -hmm. Question has come forth. What's something that brings you joy that you hold on to in times like this? What brings you joy? Good note to end on, Black joy. What brings you joy in times like this? I would say being at home in my, I'm from Memphis, and so majority predominantly Black spaces bring me so much joy because people are able to exist and just be. I'm going to say for me, what brings me joy is family, right? Just being able to be around my family and just laugh and enjoy one another. I am making music and music is bringing me joy. Dancing brings me joy, especially African derived dance. And also spending time with my grandchildren and grandnieces and nephews and just experiencing the world through their eyes. I, that gives me so much joy, yeah. These are beautiful practices to uplift family, dance, community, music. And as we close, sadly, as we close, I want to ask each of you 
if there is one key takeaway that you want to highlight from our conversation, our time, our fellowship, our gathering mm -hmm. today, one key takeaway that you want to offer. And I'm going to start with Dr. Thomas. For me, I think it's just a reminder that restorative justice means different things for different people, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we think about, when I think of restorative justice, I think about reparations and repair. I've had a very economic redistributive model. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the great offerings of this text was, I mean, really for me, the warrior healer, that that, that might be the thing that restorative justice means for me, right? Mm -hmm. That 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 the pro that the project itself calls us into different kinds of, of projects and so i'm very indebted for being mindful of that right that even as i'm calling for this thing what restoration means for me can be very different than this this the my real concern with with redistribution and so just being mindful of that beautiful thank you take away I'm taking away Dr. Thomas's statement. I think you were quoting someone else, Dr. Thomas. I consent not to be a single being. Mm. Jamie, how about you? Take away. I'm just focusing on all of our humanity, right? And the beauty and the blessing that we all are. Kayla, take away. Um, staying committed to the possibility of change because change is indeed possible and it's a slow and steady process, but it's achievable. And that process may never be perfect, but we have to keep working toward it because people's lives are being ended and forever altered by it. And our final word from Dr. Davis, take away, key take away. Um, creating these non-hierarchical spaces, these spaces where student voices are centered and uplifted, where the voices of those who are directly and negatively impacted are, uh, are uplifted, uh, creating spaces where all systems of domination are interrogated and challenged, um, creating spaces of deep connection uh, and spaces, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, reflect values of radical respect and radical relationality and, and ra radical responsibility and anti-capitalist values, anti-racial capitalist values and anti-heteropatriarchal values, creating spaces um, with those values and those practices at their heart um, and seeing them going on all around you there um, at uh, HDS. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I, my, my takeaway is what Dr. Thomas expressed at the beginning is I needed this. We need, I need more of this, this nourishment. I was hungry and thirsty for this. So I'm in a way uh, an appreciation for the space and the desire for more uh, and deep gratitude. We want to thank you uh, all for being here, all who have joined us uh, virtually and uh, deep thank you to each of our panelists and a uh, deep thank you to my co-facilitator, Jess Young. Deep thank you to all the members of the Racial Justice and Healing Committee and the Standing Committee on Diversity and Inclusion uh, for all the work throughout the year. Many thanks to the Dudley and Lecture Fund for supporting this program. And many, many thanks to Dr. Davis. Thank you for your amazing book, for your inspired work. Uh, we are so, so grateful. And we, our, work with your, our work with your book will continue. Thank you. We close. As we close, we are at time, but we invite you to maybe meaningfully check out the way we check in. So chat, feel free now to check out with a word or two that describes how you're feeling in this moment. So we invite our, our, our audience members to just put forth a word um, and we'll go around quickly. One word, uh, Jessica, what are you checking out with? Joy. Kayla. Humble. Jamie. Ed. Bonnie. Gratitude. And Dr. Davis. <sighs> Joy. Yeah. Joy for me too. Thank you all so much. 
We will see you again.